um, praise the Lord for, for what we have. And of course, uh, Tuesday night we looked at, well, uh, Sunday night, Sunday, we talked about uh, Hanukkah itself. We talked about the, the battles that went on. We talked about how uh, Judah Maccabee, you know, well, Judah and the Maccabees, um, you know, won the victory, the great victories over these things. We looked at the prophecy in Daniel. We looked at how Jesus, I believe, I think I, I mentioned how Jesus in, in Matthew 24 referred to Hanukkah as well when he said, when you see the abomination of the desolation of uh, Daniel, flee to the mountains. And that's what Jesus is referring to. He's like, why? Go back to the same place. Go. This is where you went when, when Antiochus set up the thing. This is where you'll do again. To show these people, hey, history has repeat, is repeating itself. You know, there's nothing new. And the Antichrist is just going to do exactly the same as King Antiochus mm -hmm. did. He's going to walk in and he's going to declare himself to be God. I mean, Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes really means, you know, an image of God or, or you know, something like that, the, the, the vision of God or, or, or something towards that, depending on who you talk to. Um, I don't do Greek. Uh, but anyway, I know some, but not much. But... Uh, you know, that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to walk in and he's going to claim to be God. He's going to claim to be the Messiah. But when, he's, when they see him desecrate the altar, when they see him do the things that Antiochus did before, they're going to realize, wait a minute, this is not the Messiah. Amen. You know, sadly, it'll be too late for a lot of them. A lot of them will have done this. So what I want to look at tonight is I want to look at specifically the menorah. I want to look at this. And uh, here we have our, our, our sixth branch um, menorah if you like, or it's three branches on the other side, uh, or you can talk, say it's a seven branch menorah, the one in the middle, the shamash. You know, and we find that God, this is how God told them, uh, God told the, the, the children of Israel to make it. And what was it to represent? Anybody remember what the menorah in, in the temple represented? Yes, sir. The presence of God, it represents the seven spirits of God. And if we look in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall go out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we come in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your blessing. For all you've done, we pray as we look into your word tonight that you bless it and let others see and, and share in the joy of this time, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and pray against anything that would try and cause hindrance in the name of Jesus and loose the full power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us, Lord, to teach us and to bear witness of the things that we need to do in our lives and the things we get rid of. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We pray for each one here and all things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we have seven spirits. Let's look at these spirits. And what the, what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5 says, Now to the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So you have to realize, folks, that everything God has in heaven, He made a, a physical on earth with the tabernacle, with the altar, with the menorah. All these things are in heaven in front of the throne room of God. And He gave us a physical representation on earth. Right, So that we would see the physical, and then in the New Covenant, we experience the spiritual yes. of these things. Amen. So we understand that. So from here, we understand that this is talking about this, the seven lamps are the seven spirits of God. And we put all these things together. So let's look. The first one in the middle is the Spirit of the Lord, is what it's talking about. Now, there are not seven Holy Spirits. No. Right? How many Holy Spirits are there? There is one Holy Spirit. Okay? Is He the Father? No. Is he the son? No. But is he God? Yes. Okay. You see, and that's it. The father is not the son. The son is not the spirit. The spirit is not the father. But all three are Yahuwah. All three go together. You know, when we think about it. I like Chris Huss's example when he said that, uh, that he is both, he is um, a father, uh, a son, and a husband in one person. He is not a father to his wife nor a husband to his children. But he is a husband, a father, uh, and a son. He is a son to his parents, he's a husband to his wife, and he's a father to his children. He has three in one person. Right. And I think that's a great thing because it shows the different characteristics of this. So we find the first one, we have the spirit of the Lord. The second one, we have the spirit of wisdom. 
as a great thing, we have to have wisdom. We have the spirit of understanding. Now remember, Jesus said all these, because that's who he's talking about. Mm -hmm. This root, this branch of Jesse mm -hmm. is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen? Right. Amen? Yeah. You've it with Amen. me so far? Amen. So Jesus had all these seven spirits resting upon him. The spirit of understanding as well. And the spirit of counsel. He also had the spirit of might. The spirit of knowledge. And also the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So we can see that these seven lamps represent these seven spirits. And um, when we find, when we talk about Jesus having all of these characteristics upon him. Right? Mm -hmm. Now what does the Bible say about the beginning of knowledge? Uh, sorry, the fear of the Lord. Sorry? Shout it out. Beginning of wisdom. Okay? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? So we can see that uh, it goes between the two in there. Right? So it's a cycle. Right? So we start off with the Spirit of the Lord because without the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, none of these things are possible. And so we start at this end, we start with wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge. And the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. And the, spirit of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? So we go back to the beginning. You see how that works? So it's a never-ending cycle of these things. So we can see that the menorah in the seven-branch menorah represents the seven spirits of God. Now, I've said this many times, but for just for, for, for folks that may not know this or may be watching, I don't understand. In, in uh, the, Bible, the, the Talmud, sorry, uh, the Jewish Talmud says that 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the menorah stopped staying lit. It would not burn. Right? It burned all the time, even, even during the time of the Maccabees, when they relit the menorah after it had been you know, desecrated by the, 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 the Greeks and it had been destroyed. They, they put together a new one, basically. And um, it, it, it was able to be lit. But 40 years before the destruction of the Jerusalem, the temple, it stopped being lit. No matter what they do, it went out. And we know that 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. That puts it back to AD 30. And we realized what happened in AD 30 that would signify that God's presence was no longer in the temple. Not so much that. That, goes, that, that is right. The temple curse. Temple curse. Well, yeah, the temple was basically done because Jesus fulfilled all that needed to be done within the temple. But uh, we find that the scarlet thread that was tied to the scapegoat, they said that it changed color. Well, that stopped changing color according to the Talmud. You know, we find that the gates never stayed shut, it kept going. But all in the same year, it didn't say it happened at, at Passover, it said it happened that year. And also what they said was the goat for the Lord on Yom Kippur always came up in the left hand. In other words, they could not ever pick a sacrifice for atonement from then on. They couldn't do it. So in other words, there was no way that they could atone for their sins by these goats. Why? Because like Brother Derek said, Jesus had died, he was buried, and he rose again. But the reason why the Spirit, the lamp, went out is because the Holy Spirit did not now dwell in the temple. The fullness of the Spirit was not in the temple. Well, it wasn't the temple, but a different temple. It was in the temple of our bodies. Because the, the prophecy of Joel will began to be fulfillment. The whole the Bible says that God, he said, I will pour my Spirit on all flesh. And sure, everyone that believes receives the Holy Spirit as an indwelling Spirit. But also they want to receive, or should want to receive, the fullness Amen. of the Spirit. Amen. Right? And we receive that fullness in many, by getting right with the Lord, by dedicating Amen. ourselves. We're never going to experience the fullness of the Spirit by just sitting on our, our butts and not doing anything. Amen. We have got to, the Bible says, be ye filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine or success, but be filled with the Spirit. So it's something that's under our control. The Holy Spirit wants to fill us. But we've got to be want. We've got to want to be filled. Yes, you're indwelled, but indwelling and filling is two different things. A lot of people throughout the scriptures were indwelt with the Spirit, but not filled. But we need to have both, and we can be filled with all these characteristics of wisdom, understanding, counsel, uh, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, and spirit of the fear of the Lord. All three, and that to me is showing the fullness of the Spirit when we have the true Spirit of the Lord. Because we see that the, the candlestick here also represents the church. 
also represents that. And as Christ is head of the church, he bestows these spirits on the church. If you read Revelation, you can find these out and study these things out. But I want to look at something specifically today. And I want to look at Galatians chapter 5. And it says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that I shall love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So we see these works of the flesh. We see these are, are grouped together. These ones, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness, are all fleshly lusts. Adultery and fornication, obviously, we're specifically talking about sexual sins. Uncleanness and lasciviousness, really talking about things of the lust of the flesh, the things that we lust after. Idolatry, witchcraft, and hatred. Again, these things, idolatry is much the same as witchcraft, because idolatry is rebellion, and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So when we have, we have idolatry, we're rebelling against God. You know, when we bring these pagan things into our home, we are committing idolatry. Amen. We're committing spiritual adultery with the great whore of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And it must be said that we need to come out. And Jesus says, come out of her, my people. Come out of her. You know, he wants the people to come out, you know, and get rid of it. Because it is much like witchcraft. It's based on witchcraft. It's based on Baal worship. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> You know, hatred as well is another tra a trait of the devil. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, all, again, traits of the flesh. Traits. When people, the, one, of the, the, one, of the, one of the things I can't stand is when people fire scriptures out of context. You know, people put one scripture here, one scripture, boom, 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 boom. They fire all these scriptures, not thinking about the context. They don't care about the context. It's just that that verse says what they want to say. But they've missed out before and after. And that's a great problem because you're not taking in context. Mm -hmm. You know? Amen. You know, if somebody said in Scotland here, I could murder a chinky. Well, out of context, <laughs> it sounds like he's going to commit a vicious hate, a racial hate crime. I'm going to murder a chinky. And, he's, and, and but someone would say, my goodness, phone the police. He's planning to kill a Chinese person. But that's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is, I'm very hungry for Chinese food. <laughs> so see, out of context, it's like, ah! I mean, really shouldn't use that phrase anyway. But, uh, but it just goes to show that, that when people don't understand and take it out of context, it's an entirely different meaning. Like the, 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 late, the American mystery down in, in South in England, who took her, her husband's um, trousers and such to the, the, the laundry and asked them to starch her husband's pants. You know, I says, can you please starch my husband's pants? And they're like, oh no, pants very itchy, very itchy. We don't starch a pants. We starch a trouser, but no, no starch a pants. You know, <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like, can you imagine that? Starch, starched uh, underwear, starch pork. Start, I, I mean, I don't think we can move for a week with that. <laughs> but anyway, we see when things are out of context, we don't get them. So when we need to make sure that our, our verses, when we study, we're studying in context, so that we don't have heresies, we don't have strife, strife in these things. Then we come on to things like envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. All these things are just building up more works of the flesh, because all these things lead to that. Envying leads to murder. You know, because somebody envies, somebody is jealous, and that, and that is oftentimes the most common reason for murder is usually jealousy. It's hatred or jealousy of some form, which then leads to drunkenness and revelings and all these kind of things and such like. 
of the which I tell you before, as I've told you, time passes. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This must be said that if we're doing some of these things in this category, we will not take part in the millennial reign of Christ. Because that's what that kingdom of God they was talking about. It's talking about future kingdom. People have got this idea that we can live our life free from law, free from any of these things, do what we want, and as long as we go to church on a Sunday, then, then God's going God to come back, we're going to be raptured, we're going uh, to have a marriage supper, la da da da, da. we're going to come back and conquer, we're going to live in reign with Christ for a thousand years. What about this? Paul says, you do those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why would he even be talking to a lost person here? He's not talking to lost people. The context says he's not talking to lost people. You read the rest of the chapter, he's not talking to lost people. You read the next verses following, you will know that he's not talking to lost people. He's talking to people that are saved, that are born again, saying, hey, you that are doing these things, you may be saved, sure, but you're doing these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will not inherit anything in the millennium. He's not talking about heaven. It's talking about what we will inherit, the bride of Christ. It's a faithful bride, folks. It's not a given that you're saved and you will make the, that you will make the bride of Christ. That is not a given. You must be found faithful. There's too many scriptures that talk about it. Too many scriptures. Too many scriptures that says otherwise. Let's look at these. Now, we come on to a nine-branch menorah. We use for a kanakai. Um, and... Uh, this is used for, for Hanukkah. It's nine branch. And they say because it lasted for eight days, that one candle each day with Shamash candle was lit every night, and by the other ones, it's lit. And we see in the scriptures, we see in Zechariah that talks about um, the candlestick there, the, the lampstand, the candlestick, um, the menorah, uh, between two olive trees, two wild olive trees. And we see that one definition of those is the two witnesses that will go forth, the two witnesses on either side. Of this, but another instance we see uh, in Romans chapter ten, I believe it is, that Paul talks about um, the branches, the original branches taken off, and the new ones, the wild olive branches being grafted in, and that's talking about Gentiles being grafted in to God's family, and so we can see that we have this uh, seven branch menorah and the two wild olive branches grafted in on either side to make up the fullness. Of God's pouring out onto all people. Now let's look. It says, "But the fruit of the spirit, right? Part of what we do, we've looked at the the fruits of the flesh. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So they that are Christ are crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the spirit, this is also walk in the spirit. And a few verses back it says." If you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Anybody that's saved is not under the law. Amen. Anybody that's ever been saved has always been under grace. Adam was under grace. Why? Because God didn't kill him right away when he, saved, when he sinned. God sacrificed and prepared and atoned for his sin. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. People say, how was Abraham saved? By the works of the flesh? No, because of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The Bible says we're saved by grace through what? Yeah. Faith. So if you have faith, therefore you have grace. Amen. It's not a big deal. It's not law and grace. It's law and grace. Amen. They go together. Mm -hmm. You can't have grace if you don't have law. Because sin is transgression of the law. And if there's no law to break, you don't need grace. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Amen. right? But anybody that's saved is under grace. Why? Because we're not going to die... Uh, we're, we're not going to die spiritually from the root of our sins. Jesus has paid the price. Jesus has paid and redeemed us from the curse of the law, which means that if we break God's law, we won't die. It will hurt you physically. It will hurt you spiritually. But it's not a demand that you're taken out and stoned if you gather sticks on the Sabbath. You know, or any of these things. You know, but lying, stealing, adultery, all these things of the Ten Commandments, they're part of God's law. But Jesus said we're redeemed, or Paul said we're redeemed from the curse of the law, which means that if we do those things, we don't necessarily require to die because Jesus has died for us. But if we are saved, we are all under grace, but it does not give us a right.
to break God's law. It doesn't give us a right to go out and say, right, I can do all these things I want to do. Like Paul says, use not this liberty, an occasion for the flesh, a starting point for the flesh, a doorway for the flesh. Don't use these things. And he tells us that the fruit of the Spirit. Now, how many fruits are there? there? It says that we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. How many fruit is there? Let's start with love. Because God is love. So the first one, the first fruit of the Spirit is love. Really, the fruit of the Spirit is only love. And if we have love, the others just kind of are flavors of that same fruit, if you think about it that way. Right? There's not really nine different fruits. If you like, the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love. But everything else just comes along if we have love. So let's look. We have love. If we have love because God is love, we have joy. Why? Because we our names are written in the book, Lamb's book in the Lamb in the book of life. God will and they're written in the Lamb's book of life too if you're faithful. Because that's the why there's two different things between the book of life and the Lamb's book of life. You need to study those things out. You know, there are two different things. So we have love, we have joy, we have peace. Great peace have they which love thy what? Neighbor. Law. Right? See? So, but we love God's word, we love God's law, we have great peace. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Yeah. I think I've quoted it right. Yeah. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. I think that that's not quite right, but that's the essence of it. But we have peace. Why? Because we have joy, because our mind is stayed on Christ. Our mind is stayed on the Lord. We're able to have long suffering. We suffer long. Sometimes we suffer long, sometimes we're long suffering. God is also long suffering with us. Sometimes He'll suffer long, with waiting for us to change our ways, waiting for us to get rid of the things that, that offend Him. You know, this time of year, ask God if there's things in your life that offend Him. Ask him. Ask him if there's idolatry in your life. If there's things that, that are, are taking his place where he should be. Ask him. Seek him out. Seek out his faith. He is long-suffering. But he also is a jealous God. Right. And he wants us to worship him only. Not anybody else. Amen. Gentleness. Another fruit. And goodness. You know, the Bible says that he that turns away from the poor uh, shall have many a curse. So it tells us we're cursed if we turn our, our, our eyes away from that. In gentleness, we find that we should not come with anger. When someone has a disagreement with us, or so we're trying to give a point across, it should always be in gentleness. It should always be in meekness and fear. It should never be in anger, because I realized a long time ago that if I got angry at someone's disagreement, and most of the time it was me that was in the wrong. And every time it's been proven true. But when I have peace about what I'm discussing, then I usually know that the whole, this Holy Spirit is there. But when there's anger involved, it usually means that the person is angry, is wrong. Because anger is not a fruit of the Spirit. Is it? No. So when we're discussing things of the Bible, you're getting angry. Stop. Wait a minute. Why are you getting angry? He said, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Yes, there's a righteous anger when you know that it's the truth. You know, it angers me that so many people, so many Christians, um, proclaim to be Christians, yet invite the devil into their homes once a year on Halloween. Put up pagan idols and bring them into the church when the Bible is clear against it. I mean, the one pagan idol that everybody keeps bringing in and tells us in Jeremiah chapter 10 not to do these things. Don't bring the tree out of the forest. Don't decorate it with silver and gold and hammer it with nails that move. No, I mean, what else can it be? You can go round in circles about it all day, every day, but it's still, that's exactly what you're doing. Another fruit is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That we have meekness. Meekness, humility. You know, I, I re recollect our journey, and my journey specifically, and it took, how things took me a long time to get. Some things took a long time 
Some things were instant, but some things were a long time. Some things are wrestled with. Why? Because of uh, presuppositions or uh, a denominational indoctrination. Because, oh, well, that's what the preacher said, and, well, that's what such and such said. And no matter what scriptures people fired at you, you just held on to that belief, and nobody would change your mind. It's like, what does the Bible say? We need to be meek. We need to have humility to say, hey, Bible says it. We are wrong. Amen. And the, one of the problems today is people are not willing to admit when they're wrong. Right. And we have to. Mm -hmm. If you find out you're wrong, you need to just say, hey, I was wrong. And the thing you want to do is correct that error and make sure other people don't fall by the same wayside. So I understand what I'm trying to tell someone that, that they might be in a similar position to me, that they've had the same denominational indoctrination and it's hard for them. So I know how they think and God has given me patience to deal with them. Sometimes I'm like, why can't you see it? But then the Lord says, hey, how long did it take you? And I'm like, yes, Lord. Especially somebody that's been, you know, a long, long time ago. It takes a while. Also temperance. Keep the heat, mm -hmm. they say. <laughs> but you notice that there are nine fruits of the Spirit corresponding with the nine branches on the menorah. So isn't it fitting? Isn't it fitting that the, the original menorah represents the Holy Spirit in the temple? And now the nine branch menorah represents the Holy Spirit in our temple? And there are seven spirits of God? But now in us there are nine fruits of the Spirit. Do you think that was a coincidence? No. Oh, no. No. The only time there's a coincidence is where God chooses to remain anonymous. That's the only coincidence mm -hmm. there ever is. So let us work on our fruit of the Spirit. You say, we can't work on the fruit of the Spirit. You're right. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to flow out of us. The only way we're going to get them to flow out of us is get rid of all those things that offend. Amen. Is to get those pigs off the altar. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the big things about Hanukkah was cleaning up the temple, tearing down that old altar. Mm -hmm. It was defiled. It was it was done. They could not do anything. It had to be sacred. And so they took out those old stones and brought in new stones and dedicated a new altar unto the Lord. The Bible says that we are a new creature. All things are passed Amen. away. We're going to get rid of those old things, those old ways. A lot of us, and we've seen people this year, go back to their old ways. When we know better, God says, hey, you know better than this. There's problems in your life. It may be because of a curse. It may be because of some other thing that's hanging on from your past. We need to figure out that root and deal with it, kill that root, and move on. Amen. And let the Holy Spirit fill yes. those voids and move on from there to be the new creature that we need to be. Yes, we're new creatures. Old things are passed away. But sometimes we like to drag them things up again. And the devil loves to drag up our past. It's his favorite thing to drag up is our past. Amen. And a lot of people let him. A lot of people are suffering trials and, and persecutions needlessly. Now the Bible says we're going to be persecuted as Christians and rulers of God. There's a given. But a lot of people are under things, attacks, so much more heavily and they don't need to be because they're not fighting the spiritual war. They think they are, but they're not getting the victory. victory. So let us clear the pigs off our altar, the spiritual pigs. Let us clear them all. Let us look and see what is hindering our walk. Let us look at those roots. Let us find those things of our past that may be still affecting us today. Let us look and see where the devil or his demons may be attacking us from things. Let us put on the whole armor of God. Let us take up the sword of the Spirit. And let us resist. Not giving place to the devil. People often tell me, oh, oh, this is ridiculous. No, the devil can't hurt you. The demons can't hurt you because you're born again believer. Yeah, that's going to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If that is true, why do we have a whole armor of God? Why does it say neither give place to the devil? Why did Jesus say to Peter that the devil desired to sift you as wheat? Why did it say the adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeking, walking about, seeking whom he may devour? 
Let me ask you this. You think the devil is going to devour lost people? Why would he? They're already his. The ones he wants to devour is the Christian that's serving God. Let me tell you something. You're on fire for God. You're doing the things that God wants you to do. You've got a target on you. And the devil is after you, waiting for a chance uh, for, because you slipped up. Don't give place to the devil. Paul says we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant, but yet we are. People say ignorance is bliss. No, when it comes to that. Or Amos says, my people are destroyed. For what? A lack of knowledge. Because they do not know how to venture into spiritual warfare. First thing you're trained on is the enemy. Know your enemy. Learn about your enemy. Whether you're playing professional sports or any kind of sport, you want to study who you're going to be playing up against. You watch old game films, you study, you send scouts out in the old days when they didn't have game films to see. That's what scouts were for. They got from the army. The army would go out and scout and see what the enemy did. Come back and tell them, say, this is what they're doing, this is how they fight. They learn about the enemy. They learn the weaknesses. They learn the strengths. That's what we've got to do. But it starts with cleaning ourselves up, cleaning out the things that offend, and cleaning out the things that pollute our minds and our bodies and our homes, getting rid of the accursed things. Amen. Cleaning up, tearing down the altars of Baal, and letting the Holy Spirit lead in these things. I hope you are willing to let God lead in these things and, uh, and do that. I hope. 